They call it the Samsung Galaxy Book 3 Pro 360. Now this laptop is the best of i7 1360p that I have seen. They really take this chip to the next level, both in the Book 2 and then of course this year in the Book 3. Now I'll be doing a head-to-head -head review between the Book 2 and the Book 3, so don't miss out on that. I'll link a bunch of videos up. I'm covering this thing from as many angles as possible so you can make the right buying decision for yourself. So definitely look for those videos at the end of this one. But in this video, we're gonna get into more benchmarks that I've yet to cover in my one week review, talk about the use of the pen, even get into some 6K video editing benchmarks to see if this laptop has what it takes for your needs. The battery life on the Book 3 is fantastic. We saw 12 hours of Passmark productivity battery life, 14 hours of streaming video playback, six hours of Photoshop work, and four hours and 30 minutes of video editing work inside of Premiere Pro. I conducted all of these tests with a screen brightness at 20% and on silent mode. Now in regards to the screen, it is a fantastic 16 by 10 aspect ratio, 16 inch display. It has a screen resolution of 2880 by 1800. It reaches 412 nits of screen brightness at 100% sRGB, 97% Adobe RGB, and 99% DCI-P3, all at a Delta E of 0.63. So it has a fantastic color gamut range and it's very accurate in the reproduction of those colors, making this laptop fantastic for digital artists graphic designers, photographers, and video editors alike. Now some boo-boos in my opinion on this laptop is no upgradable RAM post-purchase, no SSD upgrade available post-purchase. So whatever you buy this laptop with is what it will stay at. So say you buy it with 16 gigs of RAM, you actually can't even upgrade it purchasing from Samsung or Best Buy to 32 gigs. It actually caps out at 16 gigs of RAM. If you wanna get up to 32 gigs, you actually have to go with the Galaxy Book Ultra. Now, I will be doing a full review on the Ultra. I received word from Samsung that they will be sending me one, fingers crossed on that being soon. So I'll definitely be doing the comparison between the Book 3 Pro 360 and the Ultra. For those of you that missed the unboxing, we'll do a quick run through of the ports and the webcam. You can see we have an HDMI to USB type C's on the left side panel. And on the right side panel, we have a USB type A, a headphone jack and a micro SD card reader. This, this, this is the webcam on the Samsung Galaxy Book 3 Pro 360 and a little sample of the audio for you as well. Now, if you're curious about the exact pricing between, you know, maybe the Galaxy Book 3 Pro 360 and the Galaxy Book Ultra, and maybe just the straight up Galaxy Book, you can check out the links in the description below. I'll link up all the different models. Now, if you do make a purchase, I will get a small commission, but at no extra cost to you. But of course, that's what keeps this channel alive and the helpful content coming your way. Now, there is not a 14 inch version of the Galaxy Book 3 Pro 360. However, you could get a 14 inch of the straight Galaxy Book 3 Pro. So keep that in mind. I would definitely recommend that if you're somebody who's looking for great performance, but in a smaller form factor and save a little bit of money, you could definitely go ahead and get the 14 inch model. I think that's a great buy. Now, before we get into the benchmarks, I'm gonna show you the pen in action so you can see what that looks like. As you can see, there's some nice touch sensitivity. You can draw a nice thin line and then you push harder and it gives you a nice thick line. So the touch sensitivity of the pen is excellent. So you can start thin, make it thicker, go thin again, make it thicker. So the combination of the pen and screen is great. A lot of people were wondering about the pen and screen combination and I think they're a very good combination, good touch sensitivity and pen sensitivity on the screen. Now, I had some people comment saying that the trackpad was something that they were hearing was not very great. However, I disagree. I like the large trackpad. I think it's very touch and click sensitive. You can get your right click here easily, your main left click. The one thing that frustrated me was that it was slightly set over to the left. And so as you saw there, when I went to click, um, I accidentally clicked the right click instead of the main left click, because I'm after you kind of having to like kind of shift my arm over to get to it. Now, if you're a left-handed user, this to me would make a fantastic laptop. So for left-handed users, I think this is really nice because you can still kind of access your shortcuts and your hand doesn't really get in your way. However, for right-handed user like myself, I'm kind of like over here. I kind of have to like shift my laptop over personally because I just don't like how it shifted. I know some of you like think I'm crazy and don't care at all, but for me, I just really am not that fond of it. That's my beef with the trackpad. However, it is a manual click trackpad, so basically it, creates a little hinge here and it clicks off of the hinge, kind of like a diving board as somebody commented in the comment section. So it hinges from the top. So if you go to click at the top, it actually won't click the actual physical mechanism. You know, you can tap, you know, so you can like tap select things. So like I can tap like that, but I actually can't click. The click happens more about 
a third of the way down the trackpad. Now, for those of you who are curious about what the trackpad and the keyboard sound like, here's a quick audio sample for you. And of course, if you're curious about the speakers, I didn't think they were amazing. They are right here along the bottom of the chassis, so they're not top upward facing speakers. I wish they were, but for bottom facing speakers, they're decent. And here's a quick audio sample for you so you can check out what those sound like. Now, as I have the computer open right now and I'm using it, I'm inside of Photoshop and I'm actually on, uh, yeah, I was on high performance mode and I did not have any fan noise in high performance mode inside of Photoshop. I had some comments in the comment section saying, hey, the fans are really loud. I have not had that experience. Um, I'll even go ahead and open up a few more apps while I'm at it just to see if I can get the fans going during this review. But I'm here in Photoshop adding layers to my project and I don't have any fan noise and that's even on high performance mode. So maybe as I would start web browsing, maybe watching some videos on streaming playback, perhaps the fans would kick on, but I've yet to hear a lot of fan noise out of this laptop, except maybe when I'm really pushing it hard in something like Cinebench R23 or Geekbench or that Photoshop benchmark where the purpose is to push the hard drive to the max. Oh, I did think of one though. If you're doing video editing, so 4K or even 6K playback or exporting that out of Premiere Pro, that is where you will get some fan noise. But I didn't see anything above the 43 decibel range. It stayed well below the 45, kind of my bearing limit where it starts to get annoying to me. It was definitely below that kind of annoyance level of that 45 decibels. But on average, it was anywhere from about 30 decibels to that 42 decibel range when the fans are kicked on and in use. Now this laptop does have excellent performance. I'm gonna show you the benchmarks here in just a minute. But one thing I often have overlooked in the past is the actual Wi-Fi signal I'm sending from my router to my laptop to give me great performance because so many of the applications I use today are actually web-based applications. And I was actually only seeing about 243 megabytes of data coming to my computer from my current router. That was until Motorola sent over their Q14 Wi-Fi mesh system. I immediately went to over 600 megabytes per second on my internet speed. Was the Wi-Fi fast? but with this system, I was able to spread that to every single corner of my house, where before I was actually only seeing about 180 megabytes per second when I got farther away from my router. Not only is this system six gigahertz, but also has a 2.5 gigabyte LAN port as well as multi-channel selector. So you can customize your Wi-Fi to get the best speeds possible. Using the Motosync app powered by Minim, you can set up ad blocker, parental controls, and even threat scans, which are free compared to other apps, which cost up to $99 per year. So if you're curious about the Q14 system, you can either head down in the description below and click that link to check it out, or I've even filled a full video review you can check it out on my channel. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into some benchmarks. First and foremost, this thing did very well in Photoshop. It scored an 898 on the Puget Systems Photoshop benchmark. I think 700 is like fantastic, so that this almost hits 900 is really good. Now, because of this laptop only coming with 16 gigs of RAM and lacking a dedicated GPU, I do not think it a great After Effects laptop. I think if you're gonna be using After Effects, I would look towards the Ultra. Now I've yet to benchmark the Ultra, but I hope to in the next couple of weeks, but that would be my pick. You will be severely disappointed if you're gonna be a heavy After Effects user with 16 gigs of RAM and no dedicated GPU. So just keep that in mind. In regards to video editing, I was quite happy with the results. I actually saw better export times by over two minutes than the latest MacBook Pro with the M2 Pro chip. With this laptop, you can export a nine minute 4K clip in three minutes and 47 seconds with it plugged into power. Now with it unplugged on battery power only, it actually did it in four minutes and 10 seconds, which is well over a minute faster than the MacBook Pro. So all that conversation that I've given in the past about how Apple products are great on battery power and off battery power, you get the same performance no matter what. The Samsung Galaxy Book 3 Pro 360 actually beat out the MacBook Pro, both plugged into power and off of power. So we're getting some big advancements here with these Intel CPUs. Now, not only did we see great results for 
for 4K video editing, but 6K video editing stepped up its game with the Book 3. Last year with the Book 2, I was not impressed. I did not recommend it. However, if you're somebody who's gonna be using 6K B-RAW footage, that's the test I use here on my channel, you actually be in pretty good hands. Now, although the playback at full quality was shabby, if you turn it to half quality in Premiere Pro for the playback setting, you can actually drop only 128 frames out of the entire 16,177 in the project. Then you can go ahead and export that 6K to 6K in just 28 minutes. Now it takes the MacBook Pro M2 Pro over 58 minutes to do that same exact export. So this thing is beating out the MacBook Pro in performance. Now the battery life is somewhere the MacBook Pro might have a little bit of an advantage on this laptop, but overall punch for punch, the performance is very close. And I'm gonna do a full head-to-head -head video between the Galaxy Book 3 Pro 360 and the MacBook Pro M2 Pro. So keep an eye out for that on the channel. Definitely check out more videos of the Galaxy Book 3 Pro 360 and all the different comparisons I will be launching on the channel. And don't forget the links in the description below if you wanna make a purchase. I'm always grateful for you all use those links as I do get a small commission, but at no extra cost to you. I'll see you in the next video.